Okay, and stand by. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And my name is Peter Luongo, and I'm delighted to be able to host a three-day symposium dealing with best practices in ukulele instruction. Um, I have absolutely no doubt that you're going to enjoy the dialogue, the discussion, and the group members who are going to be with you. We brought together key international voices from the ukulele community to share best practice of what works in ukulele instruction. And I'm going to ask them to come on screen now so you can see them. As they come on, I do want to take this time to acknowledge the folks at Believe in Music and the NAM 2021 uh, virtual event that they've put together. Uh, Mary Lurzen, Bethany Gilbert, Jessica Cortez, and of course our co-host, Senior Project Manager, Eric Abel. I also want to make sure that everyone understands yesterday's session was a great success. You can go back and view it. If that's something that you'd like to go back and check out, we'd, uh, we'd love to have you see how the series started yesterday. Today's session is going to deal with virtual teaching and the experience that we've had uh, probably more so over the last 10 months as we've had to deal with a very uh, distinct change in paradigm in the way that we present our instruction. You will have an opportunity to respond and react on the chat line. We're going to monitor that and we, we hope to include some of your thoughts and comments, questions that arise as part of our dialogue. We have a 65 minute session here today. Don't forget, we're on tomorrow with our final of the three series sessions in this symposium. Each mem member of the panel is going to introduce themselves and give you a little bit of background uh, about how they've handled online instruction. And I'm going to begin by introducing a, an individual who actually is going to become a ukulele player. He's told me he is. But at this time, he comes to us with a tremendous amount of experience and background in the area of online learning. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter Tulamello. Thanks, Peter. Very nice to meet everybody. And, and that's a true statement. I, uh, I very much am uh, looking forward to my, my ukulele uh, instruction and education uh, starting today. Uh, my background, as, as Peter said, is in, is in online learning. I'm a, I'm a corporate educator. I'm actually a consultant in this space. I've, I've been working in specifically online education, online learning uh, for the past uh, 10 years. So I have a whole decade yeah, uh, of, of this. Um, I mostly work with with big organizations, and uh, even before COVID came along, uh, I was helping them think through how they uh, start to deliver their education programs uh, in a digital format and an online format. And so, as you can imagine, when 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 COVID did hit, there was a little bit of a of a of a quick uh, quick change to to a lot of the uh, a lot of the the regular training, a lot of the regular education programs that that were being offered in. Uh, in, 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 in their day to day, and, and, and I've been helping them think through that. Um, so very nice to be here. I think uh, you know. There, I think the question for the day is 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 what are, what have we seen work in 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 this space in online education? And um, there are a few a few things I'd, I'd love to share. Um, the first of that is is something that I'll say uh, I've seen actually doesn't work, <laughs> and and what doesn't work is is thinking about. Uh, providing the way you provide education in the physical space, in the live space, and trying to just deliver that using Zoom or, or StreamYard or one of these online uh, platforms and trying to do the same thing just, just virtually. Um, uh, I've, I've seen lots of, of online programs, online education, online learning uh, really fall flat in, in that format. And so uh, what does work is starting to think about uh, even from the design or, or the production of your, your education uh, program, really starting to think about, about the virtual, about the digital, about the online, what makes it different. Um, and a lot of those, those themes or a lot of those trends that, that at least in the corporate space are, are starting to come on is thinking about how to reduce the, the duration, how to make things a little bit shorter. You know, uh, if you can imagine, if you've have ever taken a training course from from your your employer, uh, having you sit in a in a classroom for a full day is 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 challenging, and especially if you try and do that over over a virtual meeting, very very much not not effective. So so a big th theme or a big trend we're seeing is actually uh, the shortening of 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 learning and the shortening of education, and and actually one of the words that is coming about is is this idea of micro learning. 
and taking education in smaller bursts uh, over time um, uh, and spacing that out over, over a longer period. So thinking about education more as, as a journey of, of discovery from, 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 from not just one day, but, but longer. Um, and so, so that's one I, th I think uh, I think is an important one to, one to consider. The the other really is is thinking about the the experience of online education, and the experience really starts with some of the platforms and and some of the tools and some of that some of the interactions that you might have. Um, and so, uh, within corporate education, we we often try and we often try and make sure that um, the the participant, the learner. Uh, the trainee is is able to apply uh, immediately what what is being taught, the knowledge, the the new skills. How can we ensure that uh, uh, we explore different types of tools, different types of platforms that let someone immediately start to apply? So, um, uh, bringing in uh, past experiences into into um, uh, into the, the the new environment and and trying to think about how you how you reflect on how you would have done something differently in the past and and how you might do that uh, differently now in the future with this this new uh, with this new paradigm for learning. So so certainly lots to share and, and and I look forward to the rest of the conversation with with my panelists. Great opening, Peter. Thank you so very much. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mary and give her a chance to speak to us on both ukulele and outside of ukulele paradigm. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Peter. My name is Mary Agnes Krell. I am the producer and director of a Grand Northern Ukulele Festival uh, based here in the UK. Uh, we are the only ukulele festival in the world to ever receive uh, an award from the Queen. Uh, we received the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service because our festival is a community-focused volunteer-run event. I've been programming that festival for eight years, largely with in-person and face-to-face -face workshops. Although this year we did do some stuff in virtual space, largely producing digital variety shows for people in care homes and sufferers of dementia. Um, that's called Ginuff in the Community. And if you look at our website, northernyouth.com, you can learn more about that there. But what uh, I, my expertise that I bring today is built upon is over two decades in higher education, working with digital media. I'm presently a professor of creative media at Sussex University. And there, I'm also the director of education. And I was in post as director of education when the pandemic hit. So it was my responsibility to help my colleagues across the whole of our school of media, film and music to pivot from face-to-face -face learning to online learning immediately. Most of my colleagues having never done that before. Um, I like to joke that we did all of the work while crying behind the scenes, but my colleagues, when they turned their cameras on and they were present for students, remembered to smile. And some of the work that students handed in at the end of that first semester in the first lockdown was some of the best we've ever seen. In fact, I've got goosebumps just thinking about the projects that my students did, podcasts interviewing survivors of the Mexico earthquake, a student who's working on a PhD in ukulele communities. We've seen some fantastic work. And to help my colleagues empower their students to deliver fantastic work, there were two things I wanted to mention. The first builds on what Peter was talking about, and that's about understanding that screen time is more intense than face-to-face -face time. The reason that bite-sized learning, that's what we call those kind of smaller chunks of learning, is so important in digital spaces is because this space is a much more intense space. You're looking at yourself. I don't like looking at myself. <laughs> Your students might not look at it like looking at themselves. You're also, unless you're standing in front of a blank wall, showing your personal space. So this is a more intense space. So engaging in this space in shorter bursts of time helps. And if you have to have a long session, enabling your students to take breaks really helps. I encourage my faculty members to never give a session that's longer than an hour, but ideally to never give one that's longer than a half an hour without a significant break in a virtual space. Another thing to think about in terms of this space, and this is something from traditional pedagogy, kind of traditional teaching that works really well, and Peter used this the last time that he was at Ginuff, our ukulele festival, and that's what's called the flipped learning method, where you give students work to do before they come to the session. So give your students a task to go away and practice a song or learn a song or listen to a song before they come to your first session, especially in these virtual spaces. If they've all experienced something to get uh, uh, the same thing prior to coming into this session, 
then they already have a common ground. You've already created the possibility for some initial community among your students. And as I speak, there's one other thing I remembered, and I just want to mention this because it never gets taken seriously, but it can absolutely be a game changer for your students. When you're meeting, especially for the first time, try to use a fun, play-like, kind of game-like introductions to get your students to introduce themselves to each other. There are loads of opportunities, if you look on the internet today, of people who have been developing those, largely theater practitioners, actually, really brief, succinct, bite-sized, again, introductions where people just tell you who they are or tell you their day. We have some students who don't use their cameras because maybe uh, their religious beliefs don't let them or they, um, they're they experiencing digital poverty, so that's a challenge. So we encourage them to maybe just post a picture of their favorite coffee mug or the sky outside their house. But find a way for your students to introduce themselves or otherwise engage in a playful way from the start of the very first session. You'll get them on side and they'll connect to each other in a way that it makes them feel comfortable. So remember this is an intense space and that's why those micro learning um, opportunities, those bite-sized sessions are important. Try to give your students something to do before they come to the session, whether it's learn a song, listen to a song or something else. And think about ways that you can start your sessions, at least the very first session, in a way that lets people connect in a kind of fun, casual, playful way. That can make a real and positive difference to your online teaching. Wow. Thanks. Wow, Mary, outstanding. We've had a big picture thing from Peter, but we've had some really practical suggestions made from both of you. Outstanding. Uh, you know what, I'm glad I'm not following that. Marcy, you are though. <laughs> <laughs> and that was beautiful from both of you, Peter and Mary Agnes. One advantage that we have that many teachers don't have is this. We're already having fun. People who come into the class already know they're going to have fun. So what I'm going to ask you to do, I can see the panelists, but of course I can't see the rest of the people watching. But we have Eric who's, who's working with us. So every once in a while I'm going to ask a question. Have you put an answer in the chat that's just a few words, not too long, because I won't be able to read a whole paragraph. So the first question I'm going to ask is, where are you from? And I'm going to get some answers in just a couple minutes. But what we really want to do is get to know you. Here we are in this platform that Mary Agnes talked about so beautifully, and, and so did Peter. But we have our enthusiasm. We have our knowledge. We don't know the levels of everybody in the class. And we'll often have kids or parents or uh, seniors or adults who play a variety of levels. You might have a, a young person who's played for a couple of years. You might have somebody who just picked up their ukulele or ukulele. And I like to say the word both ways, just because some people know it one way and some people know it another way. So I usually tell people, hey, nothing you say is wrong. Just say it and know that both these things exist. Now, take your fingers and run them up and down your ukulele, ukulele. If you feel any sharp edges, let me know about that. I need to know about that right away. Now, everybody, put your ukuleles in front of you. Put your fingers on the strings. Wiggle them on the strings. Relax your strumming hand. Now, personally, I'm going to hold this with my left hand and strum with my right hand. But it doesn't really matter if you're left-handed. You, we'll work that out. So we'll work out anything as long as we know what's going on. Now, I haven't had any responses to where you're from yet that I can see. So I'm going to ask, uh, who's the oldest person here watching today? So if you have an answer, okay, we have some a standby. But I'm not going to wait because there's no reason to wait. And what Mary Agnes was talking about, giving bites, small lessons, and Peter also. We've been doing that for a long time. For about seven, eight years, we've been working with truefire.com doing video lessons. And they're mainly for um, adults or people who can, um, this doesn't hurt kids at all, but people who can manipulate a computer. So for my purposes, generally people learn a lesson that will stick if they learn one thing at a time. And then it stays with you forever. Oh, we have Winnipeg, Irvine, Toronto, Ireland, Burbank, and Italy. Isn't that fantastic? That's crazy cool. So now I know you. 
I know some of you. I know some things about you, and I really appreciate that. But what we need to do also online is bring accountability from the student in a way that allows them to show you that they're working on perfection. Anaheim, New Jersey, South Africa, New Hampshire. Oh my God, that's fabulous. So what we need to do is give assignments, but then we need ways to hear those assignments or see those assignments. And videos back and forth work really well for that. I mean, there's nothing as engaging as having a live teacher right in front of you. But if your students can make a video of themselves and send it to you, that's a bonus. Even if they just play one time through Maryland, North Carolina, LA, UK, this is beautiful. So that's, I think, one way to boil it down to one idea at a time. And one idea might be a strumming pattern. It might be, it might be chords. Now, we have to be very careful with, with chords. If we, a lot of people start with two chord songs, and that's great. But you have to use a chord, uh, a song that actually has two chords. Please never take a song with more chords and boil it down to two chords because that's going to train people's ears to not hear those chord changes. So any exercises you can do um, and games you can play. So I'm going to take this little ukulele and I'm going to play a C chord. Tell me when I change chords, panelists. Aha! play three chords. I'm going to start with the first chord. Hold up this when I, actually this when I play the next chord. It's going to be the four chord. C, D, E, F. C. Oh, starting on C, so we're on one. the G7. So those are examples of just really brief um, one-shot ideas. You're, you're probably teaching a little more than one idea, but you're just focusing on one skill at a time. So we'll get into more of that as we discuss, but nice to meet you. I'm Marcy. Thank you, Marcy. Again, such great practical ideas. I love it. James, over to my Canadian friend with the plaid shirt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there any other kind of Canadian friend? I no, him. not not really. This is about with a ukulele That's in it. hand. Yeah, <laughs> right. Typical. Uh, well, hi everybody. Thank you. Uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, friends and discussing my favorite topic of all time, which is how to teach ukulele during a pandemic. I have been teaching online uh, in the form of sort of. Uh, Community music online. I've been I've been trying to crack that code since uh, 2014 when I when I released a, a method called the ukulele way, which was all about solo ukulele, how to play all the parts simultaneously at the same time, and this was the first method that I ever launched as an as an online experience, I guess you know where students could work at their own pace on their own time, but they had a platform that they could connect with each other and where they could connect with me. And, uh, you know, the words of Chalmers Doan always echo in my ears when he says, you know, the, the students will learn more from each other than they will from the teacher. Uh, when, I, when I first heard him say that, I was like, <laughs> as if, right? And, and the, the more experience I get, the more I see how true that statement is. So um, I, I echo the, the sentiments and, and the advice from uh, my colleagues here. And, and, I, and I want to add, um, one other thing to that, and that is the, the importance of um, backing tracks in online learning. Now, I, I, I can hardly believe I'm saying this because um, a few years ago, I, I was very adamantly opposed to backing tracks. Uh, a few people were asking for them, say, you know, in your ukulele in the classroom method, uh, can we have instrumentation? So if we don't have a bass and a drum and, and, a, and a guitar, for example, or a piano in the classroom, um, can you provide some backing tracks so that we can fill out the sound of the group? And it's not just the ukuleles. And I was like, uh, no, uh, because I, I really think that it's an opportunity for you to train up a bass player. Uh, go, go get the teacher down the hall who plays a bit of piano, drag him into the class, you know, put together a band, you know, actually 
do it, make it happen. And I had been to some, you know, some classes and had some terrifying pseudo karaoke experiences in the classroom that were really convinced me that I was right about that. And then over the years, I kind of softened up and, and then uh, the pandemic hit and that was the nail in the coffin. And it was like, now with Zoom and with latency issues, you're really never going to get that feeling of playing with a band online. You're never going to get that. You, everybody knows that when you're teaching a class, uh, the students have to be muted. They can hear you. You can't hear them. And they can't hear each other. What is that all about? I mean, it's like trying to learn music in a paper bag. I mean, you can't do it. Music is all about your peripheral hearing and, and your peripheral vision and understanding what other people are doing. When you take that away, you take away a lot of the fun of even playing music to begin with. And so anything we can do to help teachers create the feeling of ensemble is fine by me. And so I've thrown out all my dogma and now I'm providing my teachers, uh, I, I released a product earlier this year called the Teacher Toolkit, which has not just play along scores, but interactive play along scores where the teachers can speed, uh, speed up the audio, they can slow down the audio, they can even select what layers of the music they want to hear. Uh, and so we're using sort of high-tech solutions to provide basically band in a box so that teachers can, um, can give their students a feeling of playing with the ensemble. I think that is uh, really important. And um, it's something that I've been working on for the past um, few months really intensely. Um, I also wanna just add one more thing um, in, into the mix here. And that is I give full credit to my friend, Danielle Hunt, uh, who many of you know. Uh, Danielle came up with the idea of a virtual recital. And uh, uh, Peter Luongo, you and I have talked many, many times over the years about how important performance is in pedagogy. How there are certain things that you learn in a performance on stage in the pressure cooker of that moment. There are certain things that you learn in that moment that you cannot learn any other way so if that's an important part of our pedagogy, how are we replicating some of that in an online environment? When everybody's just sitting back like I am in my studio here in my flannel, very comfortable, I'm wearing my slippers. I, I don't get that feeling of that, that, that good kind of stress that I feel when I step up on stage and I have to deliver. So I'm never gonna get to that point. I, I, don't, I don't have that pressure to drive me along. One thing you can do is just take your phone, and put it on record and sit it there right in front of you. And all of a sudden, just by virtue of the fact that you know you're being recorded, some of that, some of that good kind of stress comes back. Because you know, stress is like cholesterol, you know, the good kind and the bad kind. And, and so what Danielle said was, why don't we have a day where everybody uploads their video to the Euctropolis platform at the same time? Now it's low stress in a sense because they're not performing live, but there's a bit of stress because they have to prepare their video in advance. And then on that day, at that time, everybody uploads together and it's like a big virtual recital. And I tell you what, that has been a huge, uh, not only musical skill builder, but also a big community builder at Euctropolis. And, and uh, that's something I recommend that anybody who's uh, in this business really uh, take a good look at. So that's my piece for now. And uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. No, thank you, James. And uh, I think the, the quote I used to use was every concert's worth seven rehearsals. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I, I think it's awesome that, uh, that we have the opportunity now to incorporate video in that way. And what a neat idea. Just record. I mean, the teacher gets the benefit of recording what we do to send to the students. So we're learning more. Mm -hmm. That's right. Let's have them do it, too. That's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. Good. I'm going to uh, ask Kathy to chime in at this time. Kathy all right. Well, again, such great information from all my colleagues here. And, and in reflection of what James had to say, not only for students, but even as a performer. I mean, when Marcy and I are doing an online show, we put in the kind of preparation that we would have put in for an in-person show, other than the fact that we still wear our slippers. But ladies and gentlemen, we keep the trousers on. And... <laughs> Um, but, but the preparation is the same in terms of rehearsal. We want that same sense of perfection that we're after in a live show. And 
when a student has to attempt that level of perfection, even if it's for something quite simple, it requires a lot of rehearsal. That's part of the process of learning. So other than that, what I wanted to talk about a little bit were some of the nuts and bolts of teaching via Zoom, which um, is, is possibly the most used methodology for, for group classes online. And of course, we have the flat screen world. We have all these great intros and warm-ups and how to make people feel comfortable that Mary Agnes and Marcy talked about. Um, in some of the nuts and bolts, one of the things that we do both in our private teaching and as the directors of the uh, Uke Fest at Strathmore, we send out to all the participants um, instructions on best Zoom practices. Don't assume that everybody's used it. Don't assume that everybody knows it. Um, give them some tips. Then additionally, uh, sometimes we'll even schedule like a warm-up session. Haven't been on Zoom before? You want to practice once before the class starts so you're comfortable with how it works? Here's our practice session. Come on in. Uh, we also, we've hired some very good teachers who haven't taught online before. And so we've been through lots of trainings with those instructors to get them comfortable with the format and with how we do it prior to events so that we're really trying to bring everybody up to the same level. We most of the time will have a staff host or moderator of each session who is moderating the chat. You know, as, as has been mentioned, most of the time, most people have to be on, um, mute. You can't hear each other. Of course, we unmute everybody every once in a while so they can hoop and holler and give some gratitude to each other, etc. But during a class, we ask people not to use the chat for private social time. And please only use it to ask questions. And we ask the moderator to pop those questions so that the instructor can really stay focused. If you have three or four pages of students and you're zipping through the gallery views and this and that, you're watching their hands, you're seeing a few things you might be able to help people with, and the moderator is popping those questions, often answering them for you, right? How many people have been in a Zoom class where somebody says, How's, how are we supposed to be tuned? Well, the moderator should be able to answer that. So you're not even taking up your time with it other than maybe at the top of the chat telling people here's our tuning if we're in D tuning if we're in C tuning or I teach a lot of banjo and we've got 80 different tunings to choose from and even on uke I use four or five different tunings I'll put it right at the top here's how we're going to be tuned the moderator is paying attention next time that question comes up they pop it in there um, it doesn't mean that we never want to hear from people because we do but once you get past 20 people in the Zoom world, you sort of need to control the chaos a little bit. The bonus is everybody has a front row seat, especially if they know how to put on speaker view, which you explain to them in that pre-document or in your practice class before your festival or event. And of course, the minus is we can't hear each other, but there are times um, when I'll say, and by the way, folks, if you're having trouble and you're comfortable unmuting to show me what you're doing, I guarantee you somebody else is having the same problem. And by showing that, you'll be helping everybody. If you're not comfortable with that, we'll find another way to help you. So, you know, straddling those lines of the comfort, the discomfort. One of the things I like to think about is put yourself in the student's position. If you were sitting in a Zoom class, what would you want? And I think Mary Agnes really nailed it when she talked about, you can consolidate these lessons, right? Because amongst other things, we record them and we make them available online afterwards, right? For participants. And by the way, teachers, we ask participants by just the honor system, please don't pass this around to people who didn't pay for the class. You paid for the class. This is part of what you paid for. But your friends across the street didn't, and 
you know, if they want to take a class, they can take a class. That's how we all stay in business. That's how we all still have a livelihood. However, it's okay after you've shown something three times to say, I'm going to move on now for those of you who are ready. And for those of you who need to review this, it's on the recording. Okay. You'll get a link to the recording so that we can keep everybody moving forward in, in a certain way. And I think that's really helpful. The flipped learning method that Mary Agnes talked about is something that Marcy and I use all the time when we're doing a series of classes or a festival. We use a Dropbox in order to uh, put all of the teaching materials there in advance. And the last thing I want to say, it's sort of been said a few times, but it can't be said too many times. Listening is learning. And when I'm giving my classes on practice techniques, it amazes me how much people expect to learn something that they haven't heard 500 times in the way that many of us kind of grew up learning. Even if we read music, even if we read charts, if it's not in here, you're gonna have a harder time expressing it. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't use a learning aid, paper, charts, notes, whatever it may be. But listening is learning in the same way that Brian was saying yesterday about how the storytelling behind all of this is part of the learning. But if I want to learn how James Hill plays, or if I want to learn slack key ukulele from Jeff Peterson, the first thing I'm going to do is listen and immerse myself in it. So as teachers, give your students something to listen and immerse themselves in and tell them 50 times is not too much to listen to something before you try to play it. All right, there's so many great people here to contribute. Hopefully those ideas are useful. Thank you, Kathy. Great, great uh, feedback. Uh, I love the nuts and bolts, but at the end there, that's some very powerful stuff that you were talking about as well. Thank you for that. We are starting to get some questions in, some comments in, and we will, in fact, uh, continue to monitor those. Uh, uh, but at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ben. I, I'm so busy writing notes from what everybody's saying here. This is great. I mean, look, I've got a whole page already. Um, so my name is Ben Hassinger. I'm the Ukulele Ambassador of Michigan, which, just so you know, <clears throat> is a self-appointed title. And it doesn't really pay much, but I do have a nice sash. So I think that makes it worthwhile. Um, mainly what I do is I teach, uh, I'm working mainly with seniors groups right now. We have a huge group called the PT Strummers in East Lansing, Michigan, that's run through the primetime uh, senior center there. But then I also host ukulele festivals. One is Mighty Uke Day, which this year will be our 11th year. Um, the other is a big camp. It's called Midwest Uke and Harmonica Camp. And that's in, I don't know, about its sixth year, maybe. Uh, we skipped it last year because we just weren't prepared for uh, the online. And then I also uh, uh, run the Ashokan. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to, the sash is downstairs somewhere, Eric. I don't know where it is. The, uh, um, and I also uh, am the program person for the Ashokan Ukulele Festival. And I also host an ukulele festival at the Interlochen. Um, School of Arts here in Michigan. Um, for me, my experience with online teaching is actually quite new. Uh, I had not taught online at all until this past year when the pandemic hit. And, uh, you know, we canceled, we canceled a couple festivals. We uh, canceled the primetime class at the first time and we were trying to figure out how to do it and we just said well let's get in I, we got to go online you know so we started using zoom and uh luckily we had a couple people who, who peter certainly knows well that uh got uh had already done like a bunch of legwork on all this and was a great help to me in setting it up and um so I've been mainly teaching through Zoom. I mean, our, our seniors class is 38 people. And uh, James, I think it was James was talking about uh, 
how you learn so much from each other, which is a hard thing to replicate in this situation. Well, what I love is now these are seniors. Okay. So a senior, just so you know, is anyone that's older than me. Um, and so they're all, uh, a lot of them are, you know, pretty much uh, tech newbies. And uh, what I love is to have that, uh, the way they're learning from each other is that they've started all these groups outside of our class. And there's probably, uh, there's at least two or three that have been generated out of this class that maybe eight, 10 people get together every week and they'll go over uh, some of the things I've taught and reinforce that. Or they'll, you know, do their own thing. But anyway, they're getting together and playing as a group, which I, I just think is wonderful. Um, there was something else. Oh, and then I've also, I lead, we've got a big ukulele group called Laugh, the Lansing Area Ukulele Group. Um, and I've been doing monthly strums with them. And what I do with that, rather than a Zoom session, I just uh, set it up. I actually record everything prior to the event and have some guests. Uh, artists to lead songs and just put it up on it as a YouTube premiere. And we just talk about it in the YouTube chat, but it's, it's kind of more the way I lead a strum anyway, is that I just lead the strum. So that's, that's worked out pretty well, but I'm learning new, new things all the time. And I love James after uh, uh, Brian introduces himself too. I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing with backing tracks as far as actually what program you're using or if you're just playing them all yourself and then how you um, actually play them back for the group. So while they're playing, they can hear it. Um, you might just have a speaker there playing it. I don't know. But I'd like to learn more about that because I think that's something I can use a lot with the seniors group. And then uh, Kathy and Marcy, we're talking about uh, making sure the students have their materials ahead of time and they have a little chance to work on them and focus on a particular thing. Um, I do that. I do some of that, but I'm going to do more of it now. So I'm, I'm learning a whole lot right here. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for that recap. I've, I've got some contributions that I can make to that um, question of playing online as well, which I'll do after Brian has his turn all the way from Hawaii, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Brian hey. Tolentino. Hello, my kako. My name is Brian Tolentino. Mm -hmm. I am um, an ukulele player who also teaches, you know, so a lot of what I teach is based off um, what I've learned through years of experience as far as playing. So there are so many great technical teachers out there. Yeah, the X's and O's of teaching. I like to share um, like musical thought process. Once you have all this analytical stuff, right? How do you use it? When do you use it? When do you not use it? You know, that's the biggest thing for young ukulele players or they're so enthusiastic. When they're playing or performing, they throw everything in the kitchen sink into performance. Sometimes, most times, you, you have to let the music breathe. So I, I, I put students in situations where, okay, you got all of this, I'll teach you a technique, or you've learned something from James, or if you learned something from Kathy, it's like, okay, how do you use it? Well, let's take this song and see if you can apply some of those things. It's, it's all about musical options. While we all started emulating, right? Because we're attracted to that player or whatever, for my students, I say, I don't want you to sound like me. I want you to sound like you by the choices that you make. So, you know, a lot of my uh, teaching is, is some of those ideas. It's more thought process than, okay, this is how you play it. This is what you play it. You know, it's more, you, we hear this a lot. You know, I'm in a rut. I, I don't know what to do next. Well, are you playing only on the first three frets? Yeah, you know, what? well, you know, good friend of ours, Byron Yus Yasui says, well, you paid for the whole fingerboard. You might as well use it, you know? So just by doing that, you open up so much options. It's kind of like we're teaching piano. There's 20 people in the class. Play a C chord, and we all play this chord. We all play this C chord. But what about if we play this? 
the sound spectrum is that way. And same thing with ukulele, you know. So I, I try and teach people those options, how to get there. Um, and then you make the choices. Because when you make the choices, it becomes your arrangement. You remember it. Um, and then you can emote more instead of, okay, this is what I'm going to play, right? I'm just going to play this. I got it. But if you're performing, you know, and that's another thing. I always ask the students, well, why are you playing or taking ukulele lessons? What are you going to do with ukulele ples your lessons? What's your intent to use it? Who are some of your favorite ukulele players? So I'm like, who is this James Hill? I, I, I better go Google him or... <laughs> but, you know, so it, it's, I teach a lot of thought process on how to apply the technical side of the X and O's, I call it, of ukulele playing. And I think, you know, there, there should be more of that, you know, giving the options and giving the students, okay, yeah, these are my options. How do I want to play it? So that, you know, and it comes from experience because, you know, I've recorded, I've played with a lot of people in Hawaii and everyone is different. Right. Every music is different. You can play the same song, but every situation is different. I'm listening for dynamics. I'm listening for this. I'm listening for that. You know, so play loud. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Play softer, you know? So, yeah, so that, that's kind of how I teach. And hopefully some of those thought processes will help teachers out there and, and students who learn. Thank you, Brian. Yep. We've we've had a lot of uh, really good feedback. I'm gonna I'm gonna add a couple of um, thoughts from my perspective here. Uh, what I'm gonna do first for the listeners is just go back to yesterday because yesterday in our session we talked about uh, the importance of a skilled teacher understanding the learning steps and the progressions to learning. Uh, that that it's a function of teaching that you're challenging and motivating students that there's a syllabus or a curriculum and or a curriculum that you're following in the work that you do, that you want to engage critical thinking skills, that you want to differentiate instruction for the types of learners so everybody can succeed, that you allow success to happen in the learning process and that you build a community of learners. I like to sum it up as saying, teaching is really an art and a science. There are some right things that you can do and then the creativeness that you bring to that teaching makes it the art. We don't teach ukulele, we teach students. And so now when we shift over to that online learning, what happens? Well, in my background, uh, I worked for over 30 years with a group of students named the Ukulele Ensemble from Langley, British Columbia, the Langley Ukes. Since leaving that role and turning it over to our son, Paul, I've taken on doing the same kind of work with adults. So over the last five years, I've had ensembles of adult learners who've wanted to learn through the process of learning arrangements about music literacy. Now, I really love teaching that way, and I love the experience that comes from it. The dilemma is that it requires you to kind of be in the same room to make that music together. So 10 months ago, when we hit COVID, a huge pivot needed to happen. Some of those same principles that I talked about just a moment ago that we all discussed yesterday still need to be in place. James alluded to the importance of performance. Well, I hold that as a really important thing to have happen. So, for example, the Langley Ukulele Ensemble continues to do online concerts. They're making sure that they've got the technology in place to be able to do online performances, taping them, and then presenting them to the public. The advantage? Anybody can tune in. They don't have to keep it just to a community where the hall is. They can actually present it so folks from Hawaii, from England, from across Canada and the United States can tune in. So we have to learn about pivoting. We have to learn about the importance of, as Peter said right at the very beginning, that we're not teaching the way that we used to, but the ideals that we're looking for are the same, that we still want to engage critical thinking, that we still want to engage students in playing, in making music. And so through the process that it, I know that many of the folks in this panel are using, and I certainly use, yes, they get music in upfront. They'll often get a short YouTube clip that says, here's what you're gonna work on. Someone asked in the questions, how do you handle tuning? Well, I work with a group of students on Tuesday afternoons here. We actually get to see them in person, unless there's a health warning. Well, during the, a span of time that I couldn't meet with them, I sent a video with a tuner 
and showed them how to tune according to the tuner. Talked to them about using it and then sent that off. It was two minutes long. When I got back together with the students, it was amazing. They all understood. Put the tuner on the head of the ukulele and tune to the four strings that you need to tune it to. And when the light is green, you're good to go. The instruction can still happen. The effectiveness can still happen. So then we need to look at tools that we have that allow us to engage the learners person to person. And that dialogue, some of the things Mary talked about, as soon as you build up a community of folks that trust each other, they're open to asking the questions. When you send a piece of uh, video material or a, a piece up front and you pose questions to the group, they're prepared to share because they feel safe in doing so and they're allowed to feel safe. One of the most difficult things that I've had to contend with is that I'm a huge advocate for immediate feedback. I, I, you've heard the word listening used. Kathy just talked about the importance of listening. Well, as a, as a musical director or as a teacher in a, cal in a classroom, I'm listening constantly for what the students are doing to guide my next steps. And if I can't hear that, I can't go to the next place. In some ways, I need to learn my learners. How do I do that? By producing video, by producing a clip. You know, if we're both on an iPhone, you can create an iPhone recording and send it to me through, through Wi-Fi. I can look at it automatically and get back to you. If I'm on an iPhone, as an example, and this is not a commercial for Apple, I can do a FaceTime conversation with you that takes two minutes or three minutes. I insist on a specific question, but I can give you that feedback right away. I've just uh, enlisted the services of the Upbeat app, and I don't know if you're all familiar with it, but one of the things I talked to the developer this morning, one of the things that we now do in, in the programs that I teach is that we send a, I send a link, they record to that app, that recording then comes back to me for evaluation as each participant records and puts their part in. The app is now becoming intuitive to tell the player whether or not they're aligned to the tempo marking that's there. And it's great because what's gonna happen is the learner says, I'm not quite aligned yet, I need to go back and do it again. Um, the teaching that I need to do needs to be around how to use that so that they're effective. One of the things that I do at the end of every session is I record the session and I send it back to them so that they have a chance to go back over it, slow it down. YouTube allows you to slow down to, uh, to 25%, I believe is the lowest marking. You can slow it down. It doesn't change the pitch. You can watch the finger uh, movement if you need to, but beyond that, you're able to actually hear and or go over the instruction again because learners learn at different rates and need to hear it in a variety of ways. And that's my last suggestion. I know that now I spend way more time planning and, and I'm betting that the others uh, are nodding their heads. The amount of time I have to spend planning is far more now than it would ever be for an in-person class. I need to anticipate based on my knowledge of the learners present and I need to work with them in a way that allows them to feel success even though I can't be in the room with them. So with that as a background and all the things that have been said, uh, I'm going to open it up to the panel. If there are thoughts that you have, things that you want to share, I'm going to start to monitor. Go ahead, Marcy, you were first up with a hand. Oh, well, thank you. Um, this is a fabulous panel. I feel like I'm learning a lot. And I'll tell you about uh, rhythm tracks. When I make rhythm tracks for traditional music, I tend to overdub myself or get Kathy to play some banjo on with guitar. I play guitar, bass, and mandolin, and I'll make those tracks. But for anything else, I tend to use this app called iReal Pro. Um, and that allows me to put my own chord charts in, enter your chords in, and it comes out like a printout like this. So you can see measures, practice counting, and all that. And also, there's an audio track that you can share that um, you just click on a button and you can share the audio track. So, and if your students have that app, the app is $13 for any iPhone, iPad, uh, Android, and it's been worth its weight in gold for me. So, um, my students get it. And that way they can slow themselves down, speed themselves up, and they can change the feel. They can make something a Latin feel or an up-tempo swing feel. 
But to have the basic feel to play along with, I think, addresses something that Brian was talking about. You have to be able to feel the music. And personally, I love a metronome. Metronome is my friend. Uh, but this gives the students a little bit different feel when they're not used to using that, you know, having a friend with excellent timing and not much taste. So it, it adds a lot to the feel. So I think that's a that's a great resource to me. And I, I also have people who uh, now use the backup tracks that I provide, whether I played them or, or they're iReal Pro. They're recording themselves and sending me a video of themselves so I can compile it into a group video, uh, which I really love. Awesome. Kathy and then James. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I think one of the things, there's two. One question came in in the chat, and you partly addressed it, Peter, about getting people in tune. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but um, what was I? I completely forgot. Let's Didn't go to people in tune. I'll no, come back to I'll you. Tuning. Come back to me after okay. James talks. Okay, James, go. Yeah, I just wanted to pick pick up on a couple of threads here. Um, first, um, Peter, you talked about the additional preparation time and follow up time. I, I wrote an article on the Euctropolis blog like early on in the pandemic. It was like a month into lockdown, and I was warning my teachers, but you know the the teaching community at large about this looming you know burnout um, possibility um, because it does take more time. Uh, it does take more prep time. It takes more follow up time. Um, you have to anticipate, as you said, Peter, what the students are going to do. And that's, of course, we've always had to anticipate, but now we have to create resources based in, on those anticipations. Then we have to teach the class itself. And then students often have expectations. Oh, can you send me the video? Oh, can you send me the PDF? Oh, can you send me the score? How about the yeah. backing track? And, and students don't always understand uh, how much more demand that places on our time. Mm -hmm. And so I was warning uh, teachers that if you, if you, it goes right back to what Peter Tulamello said at the beginning. If you try to take your teaching studio and just bring it right online and you do minute for minute as if you were in person, you're just going to get swamped and you're going to burn out very quickly. And what I was recommending for um, my, my teachers who I'm working with was to create a library of static resources. Uh, static resources can be uh, videos that you have already created. Uh, they can be videos that you recommend on YouTube so that you're able to take some of the most uh, easily uh, anticipated student questions and student hangups, and you're able to bat them down very quickly with just a link, say, look, uh, here's a great video on tuning. Check out Jim DeVille teaching you how to do, uh, how to tune an ukulele with a tuning fork. Create a, a set of static resources so that you can offload that to things, uh, you know, resources that already exist, and you can focus on the the in-person sort of uh, real-time teaching. Anything you can do to take some of the pressure off. But okay. Kathy, yeah, uh, totally agreed with um, the concept of having that library of stuff. Because the other thing, mm -hmm. folks, is as teachers, you're going to go back to it over and over and over again, right. and Anything that you add to that library, Marcy has an incredible library of stuff on her True Fire lessons online. James's Utropolis world is full of that kind of library stuff. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up that we really haven't talked about, though, um, we touched on this yesterday. When you start adding the tracks and the backing tracks and iReal Pro or whatever format you're using, you're now getting into trying to help people with timing. Mm. And don't forget, music is the sound and the space between the sounds. Mm -hmm. And so early on, helping people learn how to play to a metronome, to a click, to uh, that's that happens before they even learn how to play along to the track in a way. Yep. And as teachers, I think you have to meet the challenge of adding that to what you teach. How do you teach somebody to hear the timing, to play along with the click? And I think it's an important piece because all of us, in addition to teaching individuals, we're teaching groups. James, Peter, Marcy, teaching groups to play together even though we can't hear each other yep. and if you want to be able to make those videos where everybody lines up 
then using the metronome and learning how to use it well is a big piece of it. And uh, be thinking about that. Yeah, that's great advice. I know, Brian, you're going to be up next. And then I see James wants to address something as well. I, I, do, I want to absolutely reinforce what Kathy just said. Teaching people to listen for where the time marking is, it is uh, it's a skill. And it, it's, not, it's not necessarily going to come automatically unless you're like James Hill or somebody. So it's really, yeah, it's really important that you absolutely teach to that concept. And I love the notion that that then assists us in using whatever piece or tool that we're going to use after that. Brian, over to you. So what I do to be creative is, you know, it, it can be boring. You know, your metronome is your best friend, right? We've all used it. But sometimes when I teach, I say, okay, I, t I taught you all of these chords. Here are your options. Now go find Riot Helms video singing this song, and I want you to play to it. It's in the same key, it has tempo, um, but I don't want you to stop the video. Because as much as learning how to play the correct chords as a performer, we need to know how to make a mistake and get back on track. It's that conveyor belt mentality where you cannot stop. It's like Lucy, you, you know what I mean? So. And it makes it a more fun and engaging way. It's like, wow, I'm playing with Raya Te Helm. We're in the key of F. This is what Brian taught me. And I have to be able to listen to inflections and voice and all of that to accompany. Yeah. Mm. So my biggest thing is accompanying. Yeah. You know, so so that makes it a fun way. If you want to teach something and you know a song, yeah, go to Rai's um, uh, video on so-and-so. It's in the key of F. This is what I taught you. Now see if you can apply it. Nice, nice. James and then Mary. Yeah, I just quickly wanted to circle back to Ben's question about what actual platform or software am I using to integrate backing tracks. I'm using Sound Slice. And if you don't know about it, I think it's great. Uh, I use it extensively. All of the interactive scores on Utropolis are powered by Sound Slice. And the thing that Sound Slice does that's so amazing is it allows you to synchronize the audio, not MIDI, synchronize the audio of me performing it to the visual score. And so uh, I've never seen a program do this. They can actually hear me performing the piece and they can see a bar going through and showing them where they are in the music. They can speed it up, they can slow it down. All of those cool things that I mentioned are enabled through Sound Slice. It's a great thing, I can't rec recommend it highly enough. Eric was asking, though, uh, about are we getting into copyright issues when we create backing tracks? It's something that I've been really wary of for my entire life as a, as a writer and a publisher. I've always used public domain materials. It, all, all of the tunes in Ukulele in the Classroom, all of the tunes in Ukulele Jazz that just came out, and all of the tunes in everything I've ever done have been public domain. And I dig deep for like the greatest public domain <laughs> songs. I mean, uh, and every year now since uh, 2018, 2019, we're getting thousands of new great PD songs coming into the catalog. Um, it had to be you. Uh, Sweet Georgia Brown just came into public domain. Rhapsody in Blue just came into public domain. There are some great songs. I would strongly advise everyone to go for that when you're dealing with, uh, with backing tracks because your hands are clean, your conscience is clean, nobody's gonna come knocking at your door. And yes, it means that you can't do the latest Petty, uh, Katy Perry song or Lady Gaga song, but uh, one thing I'd love to do is start doing you know, remixes of, I mean, I'd love to hear It Had To Be You done in like a dubstep version and see if that you know, connects with younger people. Is it really the song or is it the style of the song? That's something that the jury's out on, and, and I'm going to be exploring that in the next uh, few months. Thank you, James. Mary. Uh, so to pick up on what James said just really briefly, one of the things that we have in the UK is the PRS, which is the Performing Rights Society, which handles rights for music. Um, in many countries, there are ways that you can try to go about licensing music, but I would just underline what James has said. Online rights for music can be incredibly challenging and expensive. So I think James's advice is great there, but I wanted to just mention two things that we didn't mention. They came up yesterday and I had email from people saying how useful they found it. The first is that teaching in an online space, as Peter said right from the start, is different to teaching in the way we did traditionally. And one of the key areas that's different is preparation. You're planning not just the content of your lessons, but you're planning what all of those 
resources are. What are all the video clips you might reference? What are all the websites you might reference? What are all the sheets of paper or PDFs? It really helps to write down exactly where those are in your lesson plans when you're thinking about your material. And make sure, if you have the time, to put those where they need to live online before your lessons start. Yep. So when James says something is on Utropolis, you know it's on Utropolis. It's not going to be there three days later. And that's really important because one of the things that we hear from our students when we ask them for feedback about their experience of online learning is one of the greatest challenges can be finding the resources that we're talking about, finding yep. the materials. And that takes me to the other point, which I think is important to any kind of teaching, but perhaps even more so as we're moving into this online space, we have decades of experience teaching in different areas, all of us in front of you today, and yet we only have probably a few years each if not a few months experience teaching in these online spaces. And so feedback is key. Plan a method to get feedback from your students about your teaching and about your lessons. We use polls, um, uh, sometimes live polls in Zoom, or we use poll anywhere. I often use the website called Answer Garden. I'll ask the students a question and have them type their answer into Answer Garden, which creates a word cloud showing you what the most common answers are. Mm -hmm. But there are loads of different ways, perhaps surveys that you mail out to them afterward. But embed feedback into what you do. Feedback, if you let your students know from the beginning that you're going to ask for it, shows them that you are creating student-faced learning, student-led learning, learning which puts the students at the center of what you're doing. And that's really important because we all want to feel heard. We all want to feel seen. And by giving us a voice, we do feel heard. So think about feedback and don't be afraid to ask for it. Asking for feedback means you're confident enough to want to hear what people have to say. So plan your work and go for feedback. Love it. Okay, folks, thank you, Mary. Folks, we have one comment from each of you to wrap up. Uh, we're at that point in the program. It's flown by today. So Kathy, you had your hand up, a quick thought, and we'll move around the horn. Quick thought is even during the Zoom class, ask for feedback. I I'm, I use hand motions, give yes. me a thumbs up. If the, t if the pacing is good, give me a thumbs down. If it's If I need to slow down, you let me know, put your comments in the chat and let me adjust this to work for the group. Fantastic advice. Ben, I'm gonna to go to Marcy right after Ben. Uh, real quick, this isn't even really a, uh, there's the one thing I meant to mention before is for me hosting online events like festivals, trying to recreate it as much as possible. I try to fit in as many times just for people to hang out and talk to each other. Like have a breakfast hour have a lunch hour and whatever, and they can share ideas. They can just talk about whatever. That's what I got to say. Nice going. Marcy, and then I'm going to go to Mary next. Got, got to be able to hear you. Check one, two. Yeah. It's very important to unmute your microphone. I think it's very important for people to always have goals, to reach forward, to have ways of expressing themselves. And if you don't mind a shameless plug, we're running a ukulele contest, and uh, they're very important contests uh, in, the, in the traditional world. That's how people learn. It's how they grow. It's how they see other people. So we're hoping to emulate that on uh, uh, online, and there's a, there's a link to it in the chat. Gotcha. Mary, then James. Pat yourself on the back. You're doing something new. You're doing something challenging, and remember that you can do this. Love it. Love it, James and Peter. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to, to just um, to, to throw in one tiny little activity, like a real practical thing that you can do with Zoom in particular. Uh, the chat can be really creative and it can be uh, used and misused for pedagogical purposes. I like to play a game called The Secret Chord, where I will individually send a private message to one student and have them play that chord and everybody else has to guess what that is. It could be the secret note or it could be the secret interval. You can use that chat in ways that we don't often uh, do. So get creative with it and, and have fun. Nice, thank you. Peter and then Brian. You know, one, one thing that Mary had mentioned really stood out for me, she, she shared that the term of putting the student at the center of, of the learning. And, and I think that's such an important component. And, uh, getting real creative about how you do that, Peter. You mentioned using an app that that individuals get get different information each, and then they can use that to adapt what they're what they're learning and how they do that. So explore explore those types of ways of of bringing that personalization uh, into it, even if you've got a class of thirty. Lovely, beautiful, and Brian. You know we've been learning so much. Um, we love the ukulele. Take a deep breath, and just smile. 
Love it. What a great way to end. Folks, we'll be on tomorrow at 1.30 again, and we're going to talk about where we go from here, what the future after we're having to just do this works. Let's make sure that uh, we have a plan for moving forward after COVID. And I do want to say that uh, we're, we're going to do a teacher in service around virtual learning at the Strathmore Festival. There's uh, access to that. I know James has got tons of stuff around teacher learning and the virtual example that he set. From us to you guys, thank you all. Have a great day. Aloha.